All right. Think, well, let's get, let's get started out. since we're starting yeah. a little late, and then we'll, we'll kind of just comment as we go, okay? All right. Welcome so back to episode start. deeper. Oh, here I'll, I'll go. I'll go. I'll kick it off. Me and Ryan will talk, and then we'll key you in. Okay. <laughs> I thought you said you listened to the podcast like, before. <laughs> I do, but I've never been on one. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I hope you had a chance to listen to last week's episode where we had discussed the types of bottles that we bring to our family gatherings. This week's podcast actually came out of episode 109, where we had discussed MSRP pricing with Ed Bly of Cork and Bottle and Angelo Ingrati of Pepino's Liquor and Wines that we had titled Retail Price Wars. It was a discussion that relates to allocations, store sizes, customer appreciation, and how all that boils down into how these rare bottles of bourbon are priced and sold. Our guest today wrote us an email immediately after listening to it and told us that we had whiffed, and we didn't get a grasp of the entire picture. So hopefully we hit on some more topics that were not previously discussed that you're going to learn about. This week's iTunes review shout out goes to Bourbon and Brews, who says, regardless of whether you're still wondering what the difference is between whiskey and bourbon, or if you have a bunker stocked well enough to survive an apocalypse, you'll learn something new in every episode. Highly recommend starting from the beginning and working your way through all the episodes. You won't want to skip a single one. Thanks, Bourbon and Brews, for that awesome review. And before I forget, there is a giveaway happening right now on Bourbon Pursuit's Facebook page where you can win a sampler pack of Day Drinking Jerky. I've raved about it on the show before, but now you get a chance to try it yourself. Go to our page, comment on the thread, and sign up for Day Drinking Jerky's newsletter to get entered. We also have a new audience survey we're trying to get as a demographic for all of our listeners to fill out. It's only three to five minutes, but it's gonna be a tremendous help to get an idea of your bourbon buying habits. Oh, and we're also giving away a $50 Amazon gift card to one lucky winner that fills it out. So please do so at bourbonpursuit.com slash survey. And as always, make sure you support the show at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash bourbonpursuit. With that, enjoy this week's episode. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 a cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, the memory game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or thebourbonconcierge.com and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, 
Knows Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to knowsyourbourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Welcome back to an episode of the Burn Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon, the number one podcast of bourbon while we're while we're at it too. And uh, tonight we're revisiting a topic because it was back, uh, I can't even remember the episode, but it was a few episodes uh, ago when we had Ed Bly on and then we also had, uh, who, of course everybody loves Ed, right? And then we also had um, Angelo who runs a liquor store out in New York City. And we kind of talked about what are the differences that are happening between different geographies, different regions, about how pricing is done, about how people are trying to get limited edition bottles in those different kinds of places. And there was a, I don't want to say it was heated, but there was definitely, um, <laughs> actually, it probably wasn't actually heated at all. It was probably about as normal as it could possibly get. Uh, and it, it basically ended in, uh, if I could sum it up in like a sentence, it was Ed saying like, we don't need to charge more than that because we need to keep a good customer base. And uh, Angelo said, well, screw you. I've got a small store and why not make as much money as I can before the guy that I sell it to? Because maybe we only get one old rip and he's going to go and sell it for more than I can get. I might as well get that money, right? So it never really came with a good uh, like conclusion or like a good... I don't know. Ryan, what do you think? Like nothing really came out of it that was... Yeah, no closure. Yeah, there was really no closure for it, right? Yeah, and and then after that, we found out that you blew it and like totally whipped <laughs> on that episode. Because uh, I do think you know we complain a lot here in Kentucky about you know the demands here and increase, and it's become frustrating as a buyer to get the stuff you want. But I I think we are probably a little spoiled still than different markets. So I'm excited about this next guest to kind of give us an inside look at other markets and how difficult it is to get some of these bottles that we're used to getting. Yeah. I mean, and not only that is we are in the height of, of release season, you know, like, uh, BTAC is releasing all across the nation. Uh, Pappy's getting ready to start here relatively soon. Uh, so it's definitely, we are in that time of the season where this is, it's on the top of mind for just a lot of bourbon buyers that are out there because a yeah, as you mentioned, Ryan, like they're getting frustrated because retailers are being able to charge whatever they want to charge. They don't yeah. take MSRP into consideration, uh, and then so it kind of leaves a lot of consumers like you and me that uh, if you don't have a relationship with the store, then you're forced to you know pay whatever it is to be able to get it, or you're on the secondary market trying to buy it in raffle games or whatever. Yeah, it is, right. And that's pretty much where I'm at because I've just given up on the the hunt here in Louisville for these rare releases. So I'm all, I'm all mega balls all day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not only that, I mean, it, it can be fun for that, but uh, you know, at the same exact time, it is, it is one of those things where bourbon has eclipsed to a point where even in Louisville, where there is a lot more of the available product, there is uh, much more demand. And I always crack up every single time somebody says, Oh, I'm going to go hunting uh, in Louisville. And everybody from Louisville says, yeah, good luck with that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like there, it's no hunting anymore. It's just like somebody shows up and they, they send you a message, say, this is here, but there's one left. And you're like, Oh, thanks. I, I really have time to get there. <laughs> exactly. So let's go ahead and we'll introduce our guests. Um, and by the way, just give you some more, uh, uh, actually we'll go ahead and introduce our guests and then we'll kind of talk about it a little bit. So, uh, our guest tonight is Eric Darland. Eric is a fan of the show. He was the one that replied to us after the show it aired. And uh, he is a certified sommelier. He is also a buyer in the DC market. And we're going to keep who he buys for and everything like that under anonymous terms. So, uh, Eric, welcome to the show. I appreciate you having me here. But anybody, anybody with two cents can figure out where I work. So, but I appreciate all this. <laughs> Not a problem. So, yeah. you know, Eric, Eric, you have them figured out. Yeah. yeah. So it would have been really easy just to say, like, reply to your email and be like, well, you know, like, that's just what it is. But uh, just to kind of give some uh, our listeners an idea of, of what was in this email, uh, Eric sent us it and he said, you know, he said, like, basically everybody wants limited editions. He said he couldn't find a bottle of Al Young to save his life. Uh, have you actually been able to find a bottle of Al Young yet? No, but I luckily live down the street from Jack Rose. So I've tried it many times and it's fantastic. Yes. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. good. 
but he uh, he told us that you know we we don't have much understanding of what happens in regards of distribution wars and uh, and really how it works. And I'm not going to say that I do. Right? I mean, this is the idea. That's the premise of the show is that we bring on people that we are, have no idea what we're talking yeah, about. That's we're the idiots here, right? Like we want to bring on the experts to go ahead and ask them, right? So uh, you know, hopefully that you can come here tonight and uh, and help explain this. I guess because this whole- yeah, definitely do this because. <laughs> Uh, it, it's funny because you said, uh, excuse my French, that you are uh, balls deep at the moment within um, <laughs> the, the, the distribution market, right? So it, uh, it, it's yeah. going to be really fun to, to kind of get your idea of, of really to kind of understand how distribution works. Um, you know, maybe uh, give us an idea around DC. Uh, and then you also talked about distributors, picks, and um, all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, kind, of, kind of kick it off for us. So yeah, why don't we just start with store picks? So like, you know, in Kentucky, you have a lot of stores that have built relationships over a long period of time with, directly with the distilleries, even though they still have to get store picks through distributors, like acquire them, you know, like you can talk to, you know, a variety of different master distillers and you can get, you know, to a certain extent, like kind of some of the better store picks. I'm not saying you're going to get OWAs every week, but you can still get, you know, a lot of great stuff from 1792 from Barton you know, from wild turkey, from wherever, you know, a lot, there's a lot of great stuff out there that you can get. In my market, for instance, it's completely controlled by our distributors. So they just say like it's based 100% on sales. So even if we have the wherewithal or the cash, it's not a question of like whether or not we can actually get one, you know, or we're lucky to maybe get a, you know, a store pick of Buffalo Trace, like the higher and nicer stuff from like Four Roses and stuff. That's just completely out of the question. Now, I mean, now a couple of years ago, it was very different, but now, everything's just so tightly controlled because the demand's so high. What about like Four Roses? Because I mean, Four Roses is pretty widely available in the market, right? I mean, is that something that is is better? Because it sounds like a lot of things you're talking about are more or less like coming from Buffalo Trace and Sazerac products. Buffalo Trace and Sazerac are near impossible. Four Roses is getting there. I mean, it's a huge commitment for a small store to say like, hey, we're going to buy a single barrel based on, you know, say four samples that they mail you in the mail, that they send you in the mail. <laughs> like a small store is not going to like, you know, send you to Kentucky to sit there and try barrel for a weekend. Trust me, I keep asking. It's not happening. Um, okay. But it's just a question of, you know, and then the the really like the the best of the best, you know, it's going to go to like a handful of retailers that just do the most volume of their core products. It's not like a bad thing or a good thing. It's just like how it works. So if you sell more yellow label, you're going to sell, you're going to get more store picks. So. Right. So, I mean, do you think, so that's, 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 I think that's pretty common, right? That the yes. fact that you get a store pick is because you can sell more product that's in your stores. You can move the inventory that's on the shelves. Uh, I mean, do you see a problem with that? I mean, is that a pretty fair way to do it? I don't think there's an inherent problem with it. I just think the problem is more with like the whiskey community. And I don't mean this in a bad way at all, but there's just a growing and growing and growing disparity between the people who only want the top, you know, 5% and then the people that just don't care. You know, they, they drink Jim Beam Coke. That's it. You know, that's their drink. They've been drinking it for forever or, you know, it's a college drink and that's it. And then you have the people that are legitimately into, into whiskey and they don't care about anything in the middle tier. You know, like they've had single barrel four roses a million times. They know what small batch tastes like, you know, like even the more exciting stuff, say like, you know, Pikesville from Heaven Hills. They, you know, they've had this stuff. They, there's like the middle tier people that really support this stuff, at least from my experience. You're just rapidly disappearing. You're either like on one end of the spectrum or the other. other. So, and that just sort of makes it hard because, like, if you're not, you know, selling that middle tier stuff, you're never going to get the top tier stuff. And then the bottom tier stuff from those people, they just, they don't care. You know, they drink whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Then if you don't have the top tier stuff, your buyers are going to the bigger stores that do have it. So you're losing that customers. Yes. That way. Exactly. And then so like, you know, like my favorite customer to have period is somebody who's legitimately excited. And like, it's like when you play like a video game, you know, it's like, in the beginning, you're so bad at everything, like you can't do anything, you're like throwing rocks at people. And then in the middle, you kind of have some cool abilities and you can do some stuff. And at the end, you're just like, so like over the top, you know, you just, you know, wipe everything out. So like, it's those middle tier people who are just like starting to come in and they legitimately get excited when they see like a bottle of Bernheim. Or they, you know, they're like talking to you about Rittenhouse and trying it for the first time. Those are like the best customers that you can have, like on this whole entire spectrum. I mean, it's great to geek out with the top, but like, you know, 99% of the time, like I can't provide them with the stuff they actually want. So, and I mean, so I guess let's talk about is, is, do you believe that's a, 
uh, inherent issue that's you know a part of what the the three tier distribution system is is that you can't satisfy a lot of those customers or is that just uh, a natural um, I don't want to say attrition or anything like that, but I mean, that's just a natural thing to say like, well, if they need to find something or they want to find something they want, like they have to go somewhere else because, um, you know, you can't do enough fall. you be able to, you know, attract, you know, whatever it is that you need to be able to bring in the store to keep them there. Well, even if I, even if we did enough volume and we do a lot of volume and like take Sazerac, for instance, it's not just a question of just selling Buffalo Trace products. It's their entire portfolio. If you've ever looked through Sazerac's portfolio, I'm just going to call them interesting items in there. So, like, you know, their number one seller, which a lot of I'm not sure if a lot of people realize is actually Fireball. Like, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and, you know, you sell a lot of Fireball. There's a lot of other stuff that comes. But even take something that's common. Well, I guess it's not even really commonplace like anymore. But, like, Blanton, there's no more, like, control over how much Blanton you get customers to buy Blanton's. We have a good relationship with Sazerac. I get three bottles. So that creates inherent problems right there. And I, no matter how much I sell, our distributors, you know, he has, and it's not really just like on them. They have a lot of, you know, mouse to feed, if you will, but there's only so much plants to go around and the demand is just completely outstripping the supply by a yeah. lot right now. And then with that, I mean, do you think it's it's basically putting no matter no matter what market you're in, um, if you're a mom and pop shop, you're always going to be put at a, at a disfair advantage uh, because basically just those big box stores are increasingly getting the the allocated bourbons. I mean, we we work in the same market where there's a Costco that's allowed to sell liquor. It's crazy. Like, I mean, even the biggest like independent retailers in DC, none of them can compete with Costco really. Maybe one can really compete with Costco. And Costco gets happy. Like how like you know like <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah, like why why does Costco why, get the happy? Yeah. No, no, I'm with you. Why why like you know, it's just like, why? It doesn't, you know, they don't care. They mark up everything the same, regardless of it's, you know, a bottle of Gordon's gin or a bottle of Happy Van Winkle. They have a markup. That's it. They sell it. That's why when somebody figures out when they're going to get it, you'll see 60 people waiting outside in line for, you know, Happy Van Winkle or for BTAC. Or I had a friend of mine who bought eight bottles of Booker's Rye from Costco. Like, so. Well, that was, that was good for him. He got there on the right day. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, maybe well, you, I mean, for Costco, it was expensive because the MSRP was already so naturally high. So, so right. that's another issue I want to get into later. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. do these liquor stores, I mean, I, I know they want to satisfy, but do they even make that much money on these special releases? Because I mean, you're only selling like a few bottles, you know, 10 bottles of it. Even if you're selling them at not two or three hundred dollars a piece, that's still not a ton of cash, you know, throughout a year, I guess. It's, it's less of a question of the monetary value of it and even of like the secondary market value of it. It's more of a question of like the expectations of the store owners, you know, yeah. because a lot of the, a lot of the stores in DC in my market, you know, the owners aren't, you know, they don't sit around and troll on bottle spot or they don't sit around and go on the Facebook groups. That's what they pay me money to do. And so I sit around and I look and then they just, you know, you'll see it like, you know, these stuff's like it's going wild. Mind searcher or something. But, okay, this guy's all market up. I'll never sell it. It just sits there, and you know, it becomes a retail outlet for this stuff. It's just a museum, because from the retail perspective, if like this guy's charging almost twice as much, I could just go on the internet and buy it for. It. Why would you ever buy it from them? So even even like MSRP wise, like so. Right. So let's let's kind of talk about that that MSRP thing because you know you brought up Costco as a very good example, right? And right. don't be wrong. Like I love Costco. Like I, I'll, I'll go shop at Costco liquor because I know like when something might be coming in. And not only that, it is the cheapest price in the fucking city. Like I love even for anything. This is just yeah. <laughs> it's just this is Louisville, and it is the cheapest price uh, by far. Like it's it's uh, naturally like ten dollars cheaper uh, for even than like liquor barn releases and stuff like that, which is like the second largest. Um, and then it's not only that, it's even cheaper than total wine, right? We only, yeah. they mark up like two cents on a wine bottle sometimes. So there is, there's a good reason why people want to shop there because they definitely don't price gouge. And, uh, for the, the savvy consumer that knows what it 
can retail for, um, then they don't have to worry about going to some other liquor store and paying, you know, an ungodly amount. And not only that is, you know, I kind of mentioned the very beginning, like we are in the height of release season. So whether it's birthday bourbon, four roses, limited edition, BTAC, Pappy, everything like that, um, you know, if you can find it at a big box place, uh, including Costco, like it's going to be at MSRP and it's just going to be a few, maybe a few bucks above it. So it's easily right. your best bet. However, when you're going with a mom and pop shop, you know, unless you have a good relationship, it's going to be uh, a few bucks up there, but most places are going to charge uh, a heavily amounted uh, increase of, uh, of the price. Um, and I don't or understand why. I mean, I understand why because they, they, they don't want to sell it and they, there's this off chance and hope that there is a, um, a stockbroker. <laughs> oh, there's a stockbroker from New York on vacation and he's going to come and buy this, you know, this overpriced item on the shelf. Like, you know, give me a fucking break. Right. But, um, that's, that's I mean, typically Potties makes a living doing that. Got his yeah. down. Yeah. Well, he actually has a little bit of traction of people going on the trail. Right. But this is just right. people that are just in, inside of Louisville. But anyway, you know, I, I kind of want to get, um, you know, Eric's take on this of like, you know, what do you think MSRP versus retail price should be? You know, because it's definitely different. You know, we, we had Kentucky on, we had New York on. Now you're representing DC. So kind of talk about DC a little bit. Well, I think fundamentally there's two issues with it. One, we're surrounded by two state controlled liquor stores. So like, A, the entire state of Virginia is completely ABC controlled. So they have to, by law, set everything for MSRP. And so does Montgomery County, kind of within reason. And then, so like, take for instance, like last year's, you know, Pat and Van Winkle 15 release, there was, from what I've heard, they had about 215 bottles from the entire state of Virginia. And they had almost over 45,000 applicants trying to get those bottles. Like, honestly, like, how many would you two, like, guess of, like, of those 45,000 people are legitimate bourbon fans and are going to crack that bottle and share it with their friends? Or how many people actually win that bottle do you think you're going to find on Facebook five minutes later trying to sell it? Like, the proportionality. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, talking, you're talking a solid maybe 5 to 15% that would just open the bottle, right? I mean, right. that's just I what think, it is. I think that's generous. I think maybe, like, a couple of percent. Be, oh, I got this for 90 bucks. Let's open it. Let's drink it. I think... The second somebody is like, oh, let me open this. Let me just Google this. Oh, wait, this is worth $900 on this group. Is it really worth, you know what I mean, $900? Mm -hmm. And then so like you have to like weigh it out. And then for like the smaller mom and pop stores, it's just like I found in my experience, like so many people here, even based on secondary market values, like price gouge. And then so you'll see the same bottle of 2013 older Van Winkle sitting on somebody's shelf for five or six hundred bucks. That's just never going to move unless somebody desperate enough with a lawyer expense account actually comes in and picks it up. So like. You know, so like I've just, you know, I've found a lot of success and I've made great relationships just selling things based on like slightly lower than the secondary market. And nobody really seems to mind, you know, DC is an expensive city enough as it is. So right, it makes the owners of the store happy. You know, they feel like, oh, every year with Sazerac, we've been buying all of this stuff, you know, I don't want to get into brands, but there's a lot. And then, so this is sort of like the reward and it's not like a reward for me. I mean, the reward for me, I guess, personally, is like making a relationship with these customers. But the sort of huge reward for the store, you know, it's just like, well, you sell these 20, 25 bottles and it's just like, it's great. And people are happy, you know, every, every single bottle of BTAC, Pappy, Four Roses Ellie, Old Forster Birthday Bourbon, all of those customers that I sold this to last year, my first year at this, this specific establishment, they still come back. I talk to them every day. Whenever I get any of the mid tier stuff, whether we're talking about Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, you know, Elmer, they're really into craft beers. So like I get main brewing company, we get some of the like rare stuff from Epic, like any of that stuff. That's just like, they're all on an email. Just email them like, Hey, I got all this stuff guys. If you're interested in any of it, just let me know. I don't pull bottles. I keep it on the shelf, but I try to like limit selling more than one per customer. But like, and they're like, Hey, Oh, you know, i really wanted to try this. So like I use my job, but like I've been looking for this, like to try to find it, bring it in form. And sell like normal stuff, just like very reasonable prices. It's pretty much like all that I can do. So both right. sides yeah because yeah at I the mean, end of the day it is we're not a charity it is a business and you know like i said of all that le stuff i sold last year nobody's really been that upset with me well, one guy was really upset with me but he's ridiculous so <laughs> so i mean I, I guess in that regard like you would just think of it like you know because you're, you're basically taking the same same kind of aspect as uh, angela did from new york that you know that's just the market of where we are right it's an expensive city it's not to be expected that you're supposed to get these bottles at retail. I just think, honestly, the myth of MSRP needs to end. Like, I think there's a couple of companies that I actually applaud because they're like, you know what? 
just take Willet. Willet's a great example. They're like, okay, well, I used to sell this bottle three years ago for 150 bucks. Kind of watched what it did. I've talked to the people at Willet. They're very, very like aware of what's going on in line. And they're like, we well, you know, why should somebody that I sell this to make money? Why shouldn't we? And I mean, again, it's kind of like rebounded because of the fact that like, oh, we're going to sell this now for $700. Now it's going for like 1500 You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like whatever at they least, the price that it's going to get doubled on the secondary market. Yeah, exactly. And there's nothing that they can do about it, but I'd rather see the money be going into the distiller's pockets, you know, because they're the one who are providing essentially Americana. Like they're making history in a bottle that they should be the ones getting paid. You know, it shouldn't be some idiot who just, you know, was told by his friend to like sign up for a raffle when he won. And, you know, the next thing you know, he's getting arrested in a, you know, a food court next to a Sabaro. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. I remember reading that story too. But yeah. you know, I guess so. so you know, you, you had mentioned it going back to the you know back to the distillery, right? So let's let's kind of yeah. well, okay. So let's kind of flip it right now, right? So you know what you're doing and what uh, you know Angela from New York did. You know, you're basically selling it at a secondary market value, so your store reaps the benefit of getting three x its MSRP value, right? So let's sure. flip this. Let's flip the script, and now let's say Buffalo Trace says, okay, well. George T. Stag is now um, five hundred dollars to the distributor. It is, um, you know, it is now. It's from the distributor. Now it's six hundred to you, and now it sits on your shelves at six fifty until there's an actual buyer. I applaud now, that. So I you applaud. think you think that's you think that's the way it should go? I think a hundred percent the MSRP at least for a while for everything across the board. And like the Scotch industry has gotten away with this for a hundred years. Like why can't we? We're producing the hottest product on the market right now. Why aren't we charging more money for it? Like, there's no reason we shouldn't. Like, you know, like, honestly, like, if any of the three of us, if I went into a store and it's like, okay, the new MSRP for Old Rick Van Winkle this year, it's $200. You know, Buffalo Trace was like, you know what, this is what it is. You know, secondary market evaluation isn't that much higher. I would still happily buy it. You know, is it a $200 whiskey? You can make arguments for yes or no, but like, Am I directly supporting a distillery? Yes. And then if that money's going back to the distillery, I mean, so be it. You know, I mean, they're creating a great American whiskey. And, you know, this attitude that we have that bourbon needs to be cheap, like bourbon's a world-class spirit. Like there's no reason in the world anymore that we need to think of it as this like dregs that we drink in college. Like the, that's over. Like, that should all be done. You know, like, like look at the, like, you know, Malt Advocate, all of the whiskey awards, like who's winning year after year. It's us. It's Japan. You know, like, we're creating like we're the new trend and we should be well not me but like the distillers should be reaping the rewards like mccallan sells stuff for thirty thousand dollars and they don't bat an eyelash like i'm not saying we're there yet but like there's no reason like old rip legal shouldn't cost two hundred dollars like jim beam charged three hundred dollars for booker's rye good on them it's a three hundred dollar whiskey in our current market like name another 13 year old cash strength rye that's that good Right. Uh, but yeah. I, hell, you know, this is, this is the other thing. And this is how I've seen the, the secondary market kind of work. Right. It doesn't matter like what a retailer prices for all of a sudden, like somebody's going to buy it and then automatically try to put, put it and sell it as double. Right. Well, yeah, of course. That's like <laughs> yeah. the standard process now. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So like, if we take Willet, for example, right, they, they used to do 10 years or sorry, $10, $10 for every year. year. So like a 12 year old was 120 bucks. Uh, now it went from 120 to like uh, 180, but people would sell it say for like 220, 240. And now they're trying to sell it for 350, 360. And people are still biting, right? Because they're just basically just doubling it up. Well, specifically, I love them, but like if you want to roll the dice, roll the dice, but not me. So like, unless you know <laughs> what you're getting yourself into, just like. Yeah, and yeah. so you know, my folks play crafts. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Catch Twenty Two has has kind of a uh, a take on it. He says, you know, he he kind of agrees with what you're saying that we should give it back to the distilleries, and now that we should, you know, that stag should just be six hundred fifty dollars on the shelf when you're there, um, because he thinks that you know you artificially keeping allocated bourbons cheaper uh, than demand actually suggests that it actually creates the aftermarket, right? It actually creates a secondary market. Um, versus something that is uh, relatively, it's just, if this is just the retail price, that's just the retail price. So it would kind of, it would if, if officially in the secondary market for a lot of stuff. But here's, you're not here's just, my attitude. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So like, here's my attitude towards it. Like, I feel like our ship 
if you will, if you're a bourbon fan, it's overloaded and it's filled with rats. Like, <laughs> I feel like if you just like overinflated the price, you know, at least for a couple of years, you could get a lot of them off the ship. And I think it wouldn't be a permanent solution, but at the very least, it would be a respite. And I feel as though, you know, like, I mean, every distillery across, with the exception of one, whom I'm a huge fan, I've almost pretty much every distillery in Kentucky, they're raising their prices on all of this, you know, limited edition stuff. And they should. Like, it's, I mean, look at what McAllen's doing. Like, look what these scotch houses are doing. They say, like, oh, we're running out of whiskey. Like, oh, uh, you know, so we're going to raise the prices. My experience working in this industry on and off for over seven years, like, there's never been a certain time where I've never been able to order McAllen 12. It's there. It might be a little bit more expensive. I can guarantee you right now, and I love Heaven Hills, and I have a great relationship with them. If I'm like, hey, I need Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, they don't have any. You know what I mean? They're just not there. So regardless of, like, what they charge for, it's just, like, not there. And I think that top tier, that top 5% stuff, just, like, maybe not go ham and go all the way to the secondary market. But, like, honestly, like, you find a bottle of William Lou Weller for 200 bucks, 250 would you really say no to it? I know I would. No, I'm not. Like, I know. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Like, yeah. Well, and I'll admit, I've because buying is gotten, so ridic- buying yeah. gotten so ridiculous here. If I like something that I try from Kenny's Bar, I'll go uh, – <laughs> I'll find myself going into paying secondary mortgage just because I want it. You know, I'm right. like lazy. I don't want to go hunt. I don't want to camp. I'm just going to pay it because I like it and I want it. I mean, hunting, I don't want to get too much into it. But like, you know, when I first really got into whiskey years ago, like there was some hunting. Even in D.C., you know, you could go around. You could find Parker's. Maybe not the Pappies, but you could find some of the really high-end stuff. And now it's just – I mean, at least definitely in this market, it's just a waste of time. Like, you know, if you want to go hunt for Rebel Yell 10, good on you. And I actually applaud you for that because that's a great whiskey. But <laughs> um, if you want to go find the top, I mean, everybody knows now, like all the store owners, like, you know, if you didn't know them 15 years ago, you've been buying, you know, your wine for all your bar mitzvahs for whatever, like they, they you know, it's, it's over, like, you know. So, but. I liked your your description that the bourbon market is basically a ship full of rats right now because it is. It, it's it's funny because I saw I saw somebody that put a quote I think it was it was on it was on one of the the secondary markets and it was like in search of George T Stag like three hundred thirty bucks or three hundred fifty bucks it's like come on guys there's thirty thousand of these bottles or thirty eight thousand let's not get greedy and then somebody put in the comments they said. I believe you're talking to the most greedy sons of bitches on the internet right now. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true because, I mean, I don't know anybody, literally, I don't know anybody that's in any of these forums that are getting into whiskey and doing all this sort of stuff that aren't aren't building collections and they're just buying and buying and hoarding and hoarding, right? Yeah. I mean, that's just a typical, that's just what's happening right now. Yeah, you know, I, I when I really got into it about two years ago. I was kind of guilty of some of that. And I was like, oh, I've got all these bottles and they're worth this. And then for some of the stuff I did kind of spend secondary market value on, I'm a little bit skittish about just like opening up. You know, maybe I get married, I have a kid, it's there. But a lot of this stuff, you know, it's like, I just got to the point, I'm like, why, why, you know, I'm having fun with friends. It's about drinking, you know, and ultimately like, and if you got the bottle for $80 and you know, it's maybe worth two or three times that. It's like, who cares? It's what you pay for it. Enjoy it. Open it. But I mean, regardless, you know, like, so we're, just, we're in this position. Go ahead. No, no, I was gonna say, like, we're just, we're just, we're just in this position right now where, you know, our perceived worth of the object and its actual monetary worth are different. And then until those reconcile and become the same, like we're going to keep having these issues. And I don't think I can solve it. I don't think we can solve it. I think the only people that can honestly solve it are the distilleries. And I think the distilleries just have to say like, okay, we're no longer making just, you know, bourbon. We're making world-class whiskey and we can charge world-class prices because you know what, like you said, you know, $300 for a new Lou Weller, I'd buy it in a heartbeat. You know, like I'm not a rich man. I work in retail, but I would still like, you know what, $300, I'll savor this over the entire year and I'd love it. And there's so many whiskeys out there, you know, like I said, I couldn't get a bottle of Val Young's. The only ones that I saw in my market were insane and probably priced at least twice the secondary market or more. And then so I said, you know what? If I found one for two or three hundred dollars, three fifty, I'd still probably buy it. It's that good, and it's whiskey. I can enjoy it with friends. I can open it. And I can drink it. And I that's kind of it. So, so let's let's kind of take it because I, I kind of want to get your your take on this too because you know we we talked about if we if we 
so, so, but it basically just saturated the market with these very, very expensive bottles. And, and that's that, exactly what happened. You know, this year is kind of a fluke with, with George T. Stagg and having the, the, the crazy amount, right? But let's just kind of right. roll back a few years where it's on average 6,000 to 8,000 bottles for a lot of these things that are inside of the antique collection. Even that's high, well, 3,000, 4,000. Sure. I mean, Sazerac, that's huge, yeah. Yeah. And so we take these and you say this is a super premium whiskey, um, you know, the distillery charge is 500. It goes to the distributor for six. It's on your shelves for 650. And that's through the entire lineup. And at this point, they might have to drop handy because nobody's paying 650 for a handy. But anyway, that's that's beyond the fact of this. Um, well, you beat me to the punch on that, but yeah. <laughs> and, and so I guess the, the question is, is that now do you end up with just like these things that are lined on shelves because you, Shelf have, because you have taken away... Um, a huge part of the market of people that actually wanted to, that could afford and could buy these. Cause I mean, me personally, like maybe one, like maybe one, but like, I, I don't think I can, I'm not going to be able to afford to buy, you know, more than that ever. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to bourbon plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. You have taken away um, a huge part of the market of people that actually wanted to, that could afford and could buy these. Because I mean, me personally, like maybe one, like maybe one, but like, I don't think I can, I'm not going to be able to afford to buy, you know, more than that ever. So, I mean, if we're going to talk specifically about the DTAC, like we have to make recognitions for disparity because like Handy, as we all know, it's just Sazerac at Cast Franks. And I'm not trying to be disparaging against that, but that's just a six-year-old ride Cast Frank, you know, that's not going to be worth $500, like regardless. Like, so if you wanted to come with like a baseline price for all five of them, you know, maybe you say, by the time it gets to me, it's like say two fifty or three hundred, and I put it on my shelf for four hundred dollars. Not handy. So let's just exclude handy. But the other ones, <laughs> yeah, that'll be still at seventy five. <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, I mean, honestly, guys, like if I saw a bottle of handy for one hundred fifty bucks, I'd buy it. Oh yeah, yeah. I still, like, I still right jump now. on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, let's I'd still jump I, on it. Like one hundred fifty, two hundred dollars. Like I'd buy it. I mean, handy's the the outlier, but the other four. Again, I think we'd all agree, like, given the current, micro, uh, you know, the current climate of our market, like, if any of them are 350 if or $400. If I knew I could go there and get it, I would probably, yeah, like, the $300 range would be about the most yeah, I would but, do for all those. Yeah, it's like 300 you're desperate, 350 you know, easily for any of these. These are $300 whiskeys. Compare them to what you're getting in the Scotch world for $300. A lot of these are just better. I mean, if you guys are familiar with, like, Val Vinny, or you guys are familiar with, like, you know, Group Body, right. like, Okay, well, so you have like Aquamore. We hate scotch. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I'm not a huge fan. I hate beaded scotch for sure. But like, you know, I taste these things and these things are straight up wholesale for a shit ton of money. And, you know, people still buy them. And like, and Stag and this stuff are just as good or in my opinion, they're even better. So like, 
why can't they just wholesale for as much, if not more, than group body? Because they don't come from Scotland? Because they don't want to raise it? Like, you know, at least for a while, just like, again, like we all said, $300, 350 bucks. I mean, let's like forego Eagle Rare 17 this year because of the rarity, but like the other ones, like Weller, I'd pay $300 for all day, every day. And I wouldn't even worry about it because it's a consistently good product and it's easily a $300 whiskey. Like, I like think, like what I think the thing that attracts a lot of bourbon buyers to this market is that the fact that you do get a very good product for not a very expensive price. Right. And that, that goes even the mid range category. Um, when you can find, you know, Elmer's for 45, 50 bucks, when you can get, um, you know, regular Blanton's for 60 bucks, something like that. Right. I mean, these are, these are pretty, pretty good pro. I mean, we keep hitting on that sort of stuff, but I mean, even, even something uh, as good as Russell's as good as four rows of store picks episode, they're like, keep talking about us. (laughs) I know we keep, we keep, we keep harping on them. They're just, they're just the easy target. Um, You two have the best whiskey on the planet and you guys haven't even mentioned it yet. Heaven Hill green label. Brad, that is my man right there. Or, for or, the, or the white label bottle in the bond, you know, whatever. White label, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no, the six year old bottle in the bond. Yeah, yeah. I don't get it a lot out here. I got to coerce people to drive through Kentucky to get it for me, but it's awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah and, it's, it is. And, and what I'm saying is, you got to just like differentiate between you have a premium category, you have like an ultra premium category, and then you just have like everything else. And like what you just described, it's all like premium whiskey, you know, like. Again, I'm a huge Heaven Hill fanboy. So, like, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof is consistently day in and day out, regardless of where you live, regardless of the secondary market value. It is the best whiskey you can buy. Like, there's, it's, it's not even close. Like, it yeah. over delivers for like what you can. Like, Rebel Yell 10 year, when it was available, I mean, it's phenomenal. And it's 50 bucks, $60, depending on the market. Like, these are great. I'm not saying this stuff, I'm saying the ultra premium category. Should be price should be priced like ultra premium whiskey. Like selling, you know, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof for sixty bucks, and then George T. Stag, you know, Stag's a bad example because the you know the amount this year, but like, and then selling something like William Luella for ten dollars more, it just doesn't make sense. Like, how, like okay, so yeah, this is, I get this it, is, I get it. The economics don't yeah. make sense there. So let's yeah. let's kind of take it in a in a direction of like because the most the most recent release that kind of. I don't want to say like tried to uh, marry or kind of align themselves to secondary market pricing was Booker's Rye. And as, as every, like nobody had a problem paying $300 for it. Like everybody thought it was a $300 bourbon or $300 rye. Uh, and, it's a bourbon. And well, I mean, everybody bourbon. thinks it tastes like a bourbon. <laughs> it, everybody thinks it tastes like a bourbon. But anyway, it, it, it was, they tried to line themselves, you know, a lot higher. Like it was one of the highest like retail prices that went out there. Then all of a sudden, it won whiskey of the year from uh, you know J- Jim's whiskey Bible, and then all of a sudden, right. like the secondary market just goes and skyrockets to the roof. So even they weren't actually able to predict; like they they still left money on the table, right? So I guess like, and they're and with regular bookers, they were trying to raise it to I guess not secondary, but trying to make it a premium price product. And the backlash was. Let's not talk about you Jim Beam trying to catfish us. They did like four times last year, okay? We don't have to get into that, all right? Right. But like Booker's Rye, you know, by your perspective and how, like what it was like to find it in Kentucky because I wasn't there. But I can tell you from mine, like, you know, I'm fortunate enough I got to taste a little bit early and then I just loved it. And then I went on Virginia ABC's website because they weren't even lottering it. They were just selling it like first come, first serve. I managed to get a bottle, and then the second after I got a bottle, there's so many people online trying to buy it. The site crashed, mm-hmm. um, you know. And then DC, you know, because it was so, already so expensive, like on the wholesale price, like a lot of people just marking that up. I mean, above normal for sure, but like still, you know, every bottle that I saw for three hundred, three fifty, you know, all the way up to four hundred dollars, I bought them all. Like, right. So yeah. I guess, uh, you know, 22 actually brought up another one, which is uh, even the latest release kind of is list, is Whistle Pig and their Black Prince. I think it's like at 460 bucks is what they're trying to sell this. This the MSRP, for, the MSRP for this, is, uh, this bourbon. Yeah, that's funny because it's true. But the MSRP for this is like closer to $500, like from what I've seen. So, you know, my whole entire market was distributed from what I've heard you know, less than a half dozen and they all went to one place. Mm-hmm. And if you guys know anything about bourbon, you know where it went. Like, right. But for I, me, I don't I even, idea. I don't even care about it because like, 
I don't have the custom demand for it. Like whistle pigs, not that like high, like hot, like, you know, moving like, and, but you know, at that wholesale or at that wholesale price, you know, like if honestly, like I said, if we talked about the V tax, maybe not quite that high, but close, I still would have no issue selling them, but like whistle pigs for like a relatively unknown entity that sources whiskey out of Vermont. You know what I mean? So, yeah, exactly. I think they're yeah. they're definitely the wild card in this situation where they don't necessarily have a history to back up their their price point. In I my opinion, this, I hope this isn't the point where you know we we're gonna look back in five years and be like, well, this is where you know the American whiskey industry jumped the shark, and we're gonna point at the Black Prince. So, well, what do you mean? Like, I, I guess explain more of that like how yeah. how was it gonna jump the shark? Well, you just say like, okay, well, we were convinced that like our whiskey was worth this much, and we were you know. Like I said, I was just talking about like premium whiskey and then they came out here and they did this and then, you know, it's sort of faltered. But actually now that I think about it, like wouldn't old rip 25 be a better example of like, maybe like this is like the point where like we're going to, it's really going to test whether it's really going to test whether or not like this is like not a bubble and this is for real. And we're going to have like a like, continued success of just selling high end premium whiskey. Or we're just going to refer back to the fact of like getting bourbon something that, you know, it's fine and it's good and you. But but do the distillers even care? Because like, I mean, this pre- ultra premium stuff's like, or Will has told me it's like he's like, it's like less than one percent of their revenue, you know. So do they even care like how much more money they make off of it? That's an interesting thing. I've never thought about that. But like, yeah, I mean, that's a fair point. Like. I mean, how much honestly, like pot still did they sell versus like how many WFEs nowadays? I don't have an answer to that, but I guess given like what I've you know heard, like their stock is selling like, way more pot still. They're selling way more three year rye, 80th anniversary. You know, I've heard that's like still- Buffalo Trace. You know, keep talking about them. I mean, they probably rather crank out Fireball that they age for two or three years instead of you know these ultra premiums. I think two or three years is very generous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, don't know. I mean, it's just like, you know, we harp on it because it's like, it's what we're passionate about because this is legitimate right. part of like Americana. And like, if you look at some of the things that the most associated with American history, like it's, in, in, it's like, it's impossible to argue that like, you know, bourbon's not part of that. And to a lesser but, extent, yeah. Rock, yeah. So I, I, like, all, I, I kind of want to take it like a little bit in a different bourbon. direction here in a second. Right. So, because yeah. I kind of want to take it back to the kind of the idea of the podcast here and there was, there's also something that you wrote in your email uh, that's saying that, you know, having somebody from uh, Kentucky and then somebody from New York and then somebody, some of yourself, uh, when we're talking about, you know, the actual products that you can get, uh, you kind of put it as a completely unfair fight, right? Now, is, now I know there's definitely a difference in the size in the stores, but is there a difference in the location of where you're at in regards of what you can get and what you can sell and what the prices are in Kentucky versus what the prices are in DC and vice versa? Yeah, I've got one phrase for you. Heaven Hill bottled and bond sits here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess we take it for, for, you know, for granted around here. Oh, we do. That's for sure. Uh, it makes me so angry. It's so good for the price. It's insane. So, I got a couple of cases in my basement. You never. Well, we got We need to become friends. So, <laughs> yep. You know, it's. I mean, this is like unrelated, but I had a really good friend of mine. Uh, he was like dropping off his uh, his daughter at college in Ohio, and he's like, "I'm going through Louisville. Like, do you know anything? He's like, do me hunt. Like, try to like look for anything rare." And it's like, it's pointless. He was like, "What do you want?" It's like, Evan Hill, six year old bottled and bond bring as much back as you can fit into your trunk and do you know what he brought me he brought me the green labeled plastic jug six years 90 proof <laughs> <laughs> and you're like oh so close i mean it's not bad it's still fine whiskey for the price but it's just, it's not the exact same so no you got, a a camera, you, got a camera, you got a camera on your phone man use it right <laughs> i did he had a picture trust me so I remember oh, texting funny. him and I was like, hey, this is the bottled and bond one, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he's just driving across the state lines. He's like, hold on. And he looked, he's like, oh, I was like, it's fine. We'll figure it out. So <laughs> it's still fine. I use it for punch and stuff. And, you know, like I'll make cocktails and like mix drinks out of it and really seems to mind. So I just tried to hide the plastic bottle a little bit. But outside of that, nothing. No, I got you. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm sorry. 
Yeah, but I mean, back to the, the topic or the question, you know, is like, did you do you still think it's a, an unfair fight to be able to talk about, um, you know, somebody's passion for bourbon or rye in Kentucky versus New York or yourself or anything like that, and then how that sort of works in the distribution? No, no, I think it's, I think that's, I mean, it's, I think it's one of the most wonderful things about it. Like the passion has became literally from like you know a small like group of people who are mostly from Kentucky or maybe from like you know Tennessee. And it's actually slowly starting to become like all encompassing and it's going like all over the country. And I think that's wonderful. And I can't say that somebody from DC or somebody from New York or Kentucky, they're more passionate. Like perhaps the person from Kentucky is just like, you know, more bred into it. They're more part of it because they're always around it. You know, for me to go to like, you know, the bourbon trail or go to Louisville or go see Heaven Hills or whoever, like, you know, that's like at least a weekend. No, more. It's like the monuments for you, you know, you, you're, you're around. <laughs> We're we get, excited we get, when we show up. We can switch distilleries for monuments anytime. Just let me know. All right. I live down the street. <laughs> you guys want to you, you go see the orange man? Just let me know. I know where his house is. All right. Uh, but. <laughs> so I, mean, I guess just, uh, another question for you is like, how do you think that this is, this can be fixed? Right. Because. Um, there's definitely, you know, we, we've talked to a few different online retailers, um, and you know, it's just the, you know, the distribution system, the three tier system kind of has, um, a lot of quirks, a lot of inconsistencies. There's definitely a lot of laws that are restricting stuff between States, whether it's shipping, whether it's, uh, acquiring everything. So this just distribution model is kind of, um, you know, a problem, you know, like, some people have suggested the best way to do this is just to allow Amazon to start basically being the uh, you know, the new liquor store. And then basically They'll that's where everybody goes through and they have them shipped to anywhere in the United States, right? Like it's a race you, to the bottom, right? Now, can you imagine the insanity on Amazon like come like two weeks from now? Like it's going to be a zoo. So I don't know if you've read Lord of the Flies, but like that's what it exactly would be like. So if you just put it on Amazon. <laughs> well, okay. I, I understand that, that, the thing is, you know, it's, it's a distribution system. Like they have, they have the logistics and stuff like that. Uh, right. The question for you is like, what do you think is an idea of, of how this distribution cycle could be fixed that, you know, makes your job a little bit easier that, you know, you can get store picks that you can get the bourbons that you want to be able to sell, that you can get the bourbons that you want to get for your particular clients that you necessarily can't because you don't do the type of volume. Like what, what is your answer to this? Or is it just kind of like, well, you know, it's, just the way it is. Tough shit. Uh, yeah, it's tough, tough cookies. But like, no, I don't think it's even a question of like there being like a like very like definable answer. Like, I think one of the easiest ones is first of all defining like certain bourbons as premium, ultra premium, and you know pricing them accordingly. But secondly, I think like the fact is like until the supply actually starts meeting the demand, like there's not like any answer. Like you know, you know, like I. Personally, like I have really good relationships with some of our distributors and vis a vis, like through some of our like, you know, good stories, but like this stuff just isn't available. Like the demand isn't just like my market or it's not just Kentucky's or it's not just like, you know, you know, New York. So like it's the entire country. And not only is it the entire country, but like you also have Japan, you have Europe, you have all of these different places who are all like act actively like trying to acquire like our products. Like and if that doesn't say that our or like our products, you know, that American whiskey, bourbon, rye are really that heavily sought after like that they can't even keep up with demand with supply like i mean it's just sort of like okay well until that's met there's never going to be like an easy solution and as long as there's profit to be made i'm going to hate to say it like it just makes everything worse you know and it's great you know i harbor no ill feelings to the person who wins a bottle of happy in a lottery and he sells it i mean good on it like if that makes you happy and that's what you want it's fine you know but also at the same time, the people that are legitimately like fans and are passionate about bourbon, I'm like we're not suffering, you know, like, okay, we don't get a William Malou Weller this scene, it's fine, you know, I got a barrel proof or I got a, whatever, it's not a big deal, but you know, like that stuff, as long as it's worth, the monetary value is worth much more than the perceived value. We're just always going to have these issues and so we figure out like a really good way to solve that. I feel um, like in seven, seven to eight years, it'll all be solved but then no one will care anymore. I still <laughs> so. care. I don't, you, can, I, you can bury me with bottles of Parker's heritage. I'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th so. that's, 
that's another thing. And I think we'll bring it up for a discussion real quick too, is, you know, in seven to eight years, we're going to have a lot of these craft distillers that are all around the nation are going to have uh, some better well-aged product that's some out better there. better stuff. Yeah. And then we won't have to say, well, it's good. It's okay for craft, right? Like, you know, we won't have to say that anymore. Uh, at least that's the hope. So I guess the idea is, uh, you know, do, do we think that that's really going to help solve the issue? Because, you know, we had Chuck on the show, we've had other pundits on the show, and they say that craft distilling is just a the tiniest little blip on the radar in regards of volume in meeting market demand. And, so right. and that the, and, and Eric can probably attest to this, that, you know, when we're talking about some of these super premium bourbons, and by the way, like super premium, like in regards of that category is, I think it's like the dollar threshold is like $90 and more is considered super premium uh, by I forget who's ever standard that is doing this, but that super premium category for a lot of these, these big distillers, um, that's still, I still think that's going to be the the main draw for a lot of aficionados, geeks or whoever that's going to be trying to get into the market and still stay in the market at that point. I mean, if I buy predictions, here's what I would say. I'd say Kentucky is always going to be king. I'm slightly biased because I like rye a lot. But what I see coming out of Canada right now is very inspiring. Like, very. And um, I don't know if you guys are fans of Lot 40. I'm a huge fan. And everything, I haven't tried it yet, but everything that I've read about their cast strength one they just released is, as we say down here, the absolute truth. So, um, but yeah, my whole thing is just like, I don't think there's a simple, there's not an easy answer. And I don't think craft distillers are the answer either. Like, you know, Kentucky survived for a reason because of tradition, because of history. You know, the other places folded up because they couldn't compete. I mean, granted, you know, if you look at the history of it, Kentucky was really, really close. But you know, they made it through, they pulled out. And at the end of the day, when it comes to bourbon, when it comes to whiskey, it's all about volume. It's all about like what you have, what you have in stock, how many brick houses you have, and like you can compare anybody, you know, you can compare somebody like one of the smaller distillers around you guys like to like some something that like somebody in my city is doing who I'm a local for and I want to support, but like, you know, you taste a two year old whiskey and then you taste something like, you know, that's aged like eight years in Kentucky. Well, there's a huge difference. So mm -hmm. Ryan, what, maybe at some point, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, Ryan, like, what do you think, man? Like, what's your, what's your idea about the future? If, if anything, you know, whether it's craft or whether these, you know, don't be wrong because a lot of these big boys are creating, you know, 50,000 barrel rick houses right now to be yeah. able to sustain this, right? So, like, is that the future? Like, what, what do you think? I don't, the craft, I think there'll be, you know, there's, there'll be some that hit it out of the park and there'll be rare releases that, like, will be really good that will be, they'll be sought after. But I think for the most part, most of them will whiff and ultimately fail. And I think the big boys will just be left. But I do think, the craft, I think, I don't know, I'm kind of torn. I kind of see it like the craft beer movement. Like now everything's craft and they're so flooded with everything. Like, but I was going to say the exact same thing. Like, I agree with you 100%. Like, I'm so torn. It's either going to be like, they're either going to nail it and we're going to go after the craft. And, but I don't know, these big boys just have so much experience and so much. Like, they just, they survive everything. They have all the resources. Like, I just think they're going to be king always. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 22 catch 22 says, I think barrel proof is the future because I don't get excited anymore unless it's barrel proof. <laughs> uh, for me, I think I need to open up like a, uh, a whiskey storage unit business because it sounds mm -hmm. that people are just going to continually keep buying and buying and buying and buying and, and hoarding because this is, these are the, uh, what do we say? The, like the, uh, uh, you know, basically the, the most selfish people on the planet are, are whiskey people right now. So, uh, you know, it could be a good business just to get into whiskey storage at this point. So <laughs> who Economy knows? Controlled. Yeah, sure. Why not? I can do that. I just, I'll just buy a, you know, grandma's old house and start throwing it in her basement or something like that. I was going right? to say the same thing. Just put it in your basement. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife would kill me. I already have too much. Oh, yeah. See, I'm one of those people. I'm, I'm one of the most selfish people in, in bourbon right now. So I'm not going to even deny it. So <laughs> Yeah, I'm the I'm not the smart one. I drink everything I get. Like as soon as I get it, I'm like, I gotta know what it tastes like. No, but you're the best one. Yeah. And then I'm like, shit, I should have sold it. 
<laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> So, uh, Eric, we're going to start wrapping this up. So I'm going to give you uh, one last opportunity. If there's anything that we haven't touched on in regards that, you know, that you, you, you've you written your original email that say that, you know, we kind of missed or we didn't hit the mark on uh, for distribution, making sure that people are well educated on, on, you know, how difficult it is, mostly outside of Kentucky to get barrel picks um, and then have to deal with distribution. You know, we touched on MSRP and retail pricing. Is there anything else that you kind of think that we missed on? Yeah, there's a couple of quick things I want to say. on. You guys brought this up a couple of podcasts ago. I don't remember the exact number. But one of the things that is the most important thing that you can do is taste blind. Like, find out legitimately, like, what you like. Because, you know, the Ellie's, they have all the hype. They have all these issues. We're standing there. We're talking about them for 45 minutes. But at the end of the day, like, you know what? If you don't like it, you don't like it. Then don't worry about it, you know? If your wheelhouse is Rittenhouse, enjoy Rittenhouse. There's nothing wrong whatsoever with that like you know what you want to come and you want to talk to us and you want to get a, a deal on a case of written house you know would be happy you know like just like my store but just in general like enjoy what you like and um i mean the second thing is just like you know the three-tiered system was started like you know a long time ago and it's a thing that like well doesn't make sense but also i mean i couldn't think of a better alternative right now it would take years and years to actually fix or to like change and like lastly you know what Drink Heaven Hills for the best. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? I think you could be Eric Darlin, sommelier for Amazon.com, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, I mean, I don't know if you want to put this in the podcast, but I mean, I love whiskey. But like, you know, my first passion is always wine. It's always going to be wine. So like I approach whiskey a lot like I approach wine. So if it, the quality is there, like I love it. You know, that's why six-year-old bottled and bond, lot 40, you know, like there's a lot of just like great value out there. And you don't even need to hunt. You can go in your stores and you can get this and just enjoy them. Like that's what it's about. So oh, yeah. at the end of the day, like if you're like just not willing to like open a bottle and share with your friends or you're buying a bottle with a specific purpose of like reselling it, like I feel like that's like a lot of the problems that we get. Like and I don't don't get me wrong, like I'm a bit of a hoarder too, but like I eventually plan to like open all this stuff. So take your time, you know. Absolutely. Buy blank is gold. It's good. Yeah, can't take it with you. You know, can't take it to the grave. Well, <laughs> well we might have to. We might have you on for a second. Great. We might have to have you on for a second podcast sometime and do, uh, you know, whiskey drinking for the the wine connoisseur or something like that. Dude, give yeah. me on one. Of, give me on one of your roundtables. I want to be a part of that. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll look into it for sure. Yeah. So Eric, I want to say thank you again for coming on the show tonight. Uh, so if, if there's any way that people want to get in contact with you or have more questions they want to put forth your way, uh, is there any kind of contact information you want to share? Or you just want to keep being uh, anonymous, Eric? I mean, I guess I could be anonymous, Eric. I just don't tweet or anything. So I don't know about any of that stuff. <laughs> like, uh, I, I really don't. I guess, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to give out my email. We'll talk about it. I'll maybe email you something if you're going to give it to somebody. But All right. Put it this way. If you, want to, if you want to get in contact with Eric, you contact with me first. I'll vet it. Then I'll, sit, I'll send him over. How about that? Yeah, man. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Just create the account. Right. AnonymousEric at gmail.com. <laughs> oh, my go. God. I can barely keep up, but I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> so. so once again, Eric, thanks for being on the show tonight. Uh, you know, it was a pretty good discussion. You know, it was definitely maybe some things that we, we definitely didn't hit on before uh, because it always is good to kind of understand what – bourbon is like across different geographies in the country you know i you know even more or less talking to you and I, I think ryan can probably agree that we do have it pretty good here in kentucky like you yeah. know there's, there's definitely a lot of places that i can get you know retail price for which is uh an msrp price which is um you know great because it helps with the wallet helps with um, you know, having nice bottles and, you know, it, it definitely, you know, one thing that we talked about, you know, you mentioned taste blind, but there's, there's this, this growing sense of FOMO in the market that if, you know, if there's a limited edition out and it's only a hundred bucks and you're already spending 60 bucks for a bottle, like, Oh, what's an extra 30. So then you go and you start chasing after it. And I just think it kind of creates this thing where you're constantly just chasing your tail in a circle. But, you know, I think that's, that's kind of what it builds up to, but, you know, Ryan, uh, I want you to, uh, help close out the show and then I'll finish it up with, uh, you know, giving some links out. Yeah, definitely. We take for granted what we have here. Like every time I go on vacation, I'm like, yes, I'm going to go to another market and hunt. And like, <laughs> I get there and they're like, 
we don't even have Blanton's or we don't have Angel's <laughs> Envy. And I'm like, well, fuck, this is a waste <laughs> of time. <laughs> so it's definitely, you know, good for us to, to realize how good we have it still. So uh, I appreciate that. But um, no, once again, it's a show suggestion from our fans. This is what we'd like to do is keep in interesting topics that you all want to hear. So please keep them coming. And anytime you have show suggestions or feedback, let us know. And uh, we appreciate it. Yeah. That's how this show really started was, was actually a feedback suggestion. So, uh, you know, Eric, thank you again for doing that. Uh, you know, Eric might not have Twitter, but we do follow us on that as well as Facebook. And I don't Instagram. tweet either. So <laughs> not here. you're part of this, you're part of this, Ryan. Okay. So you're on the, you're on the feed. So <laughs> I do occasional, I do occasional Instagrams. The bar that's not as cool, that's mine. (laughs) (laughs) Well, good. So make sure you're following us on all those social media channels at Bourbon Pursuit. Make sure you support us on Patreon at Bourbon Pursuit because that's what helps keep the show going. Uh, As well as, you know, if anybody out there that wants to even support the show even more, we are looking for sponsorships in 2018. So send us an email, uh, the duo, T-H-E-D-U-O at BourbonPursuit.com. Eric, thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Uh, Eric. Ryan. Thanks for joining us as well. uh, Anytime. I can help. Yeah. We'll see everybody next week. Mm -hmm.